Thank you so much for coming. Uh, welcome to tonight's event, especially in this weather. A really warm welcome and thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Janina Steinmetz. I'm the director of the Global Women's Leadership Program at Bayes. And today is a very special day, of course, International Women's Day. And this year's motto <laughs> is uh, embrace equity. And this fits perfectly because this is exactly what we're trying to do in the Global Women's Leadership Program at Bayes. And we do this in several different ways. One is we award scholarships to exceptionally amazing uh, female MBA students, such as Clara's. Um, and we also organize events such as the one today. And we have an upcoming one on April 26th on women's health. So make sure to check that out as well. And we organize these events and mentoring programs to create a community at base that is nurturing and supportive and that provides a supportive environment in which everybody can strive. And this is why I'm particularly excited about tonight's event because it really speaks to the power of the environment that we're in, in helping us thrive, but also in potentially holding us back, for example, by uh, creating a culture of, of confidence. And with this, I would like to hand over to Claris. Thank you so much and welcome everybody. Hello everyone, can you hear me? I'm sure you can hear me, okay, I'm quite loud. Hi everyone, my name is Claris. Um, really, really excited for tonight's discussion. Firstly, just wanna also say hi to everyone on Zoom. Thank you for joining. And of course, thank you to everyone here in the room with us today, uh, especially on this important day, International Women's Day, to discuss such a timely and relevant topic. So my name is Clarice Metzger. I am a recent MBA graduate from Bayes Business School. I'm a board member of the Global Women's Leadership Program, and I have the pleasure of also being your moderator for the evening. So today we have these two incredibly inspiring women here with us today who have taken the time to present and discuss some points from their best-selling book, Confidence Culture and here to share their perspective on how confidence culture suggests that women along with other marginalized groups are responsible for their own conditions are sociologists Shani Orgad and Rosalind Gill. So please welcome them with a warm round of applause. Now I'm going to stop talking and give the floor to our speakers to introduce themselves and share with you a bit more about their findings and confidence culture. So thank you again. Um, thank you very much, um, Clarice, for the really generous and lovely introduction. And thanks, big thanks to uh, Bayes for inviting us. Um, we should start by wishing everybody a happy International Women's Day, but we want also to wish you an angry International Women's Day. <laughs> and uh, so we hope to share with you uh, where some of our anger <laughs> is coming from and has built up too, but we also very much hope that in the question um, and answer uh, kind of part of the evening, we can talk constructively about how we might channel this anger into political energy. And we began to notice the rise and rise of these imperatives to confidence and to related dispositions, such as positive thinking. And they were taking on this new cultural prominence across so many apparently unrelated spheres of life. So you could see it in um, the music industry, you could see it on social media, you could see it in advertising, um, even in global development initiatives. And we thought maybe this is just a short term trend. Maybe confidence is just having a moment. Um, but years later, our culture's obsession with confidence and particularly women's self-confidence seems to be showing no sign of diminishing. And in fact, it's really intensified during the pandemic and also now during this cost of living, living crisis. But confidence culture also operates in and through emotions and through feelings and desires. So injunctions to female self-confidence are not only exhortations to speak differently or behave differently, but they're actually calls to feel differently about yourself, even though 
this is regarded as the hardest shift to make. And in the meantime, women are often exhorted to, well, fake it till you make it, just kind of pretend to be confident, even if you're dying inside and completely collapsing, pretend to be confident. And the idea is that the, the confidence will somehow organically, authentically follow that kind of process of acting. And this is often very glossed over in, um, in accounts and people talk about hormones or neurotransmitters, the cuddle chemicals, serotonin, dopamine, these kinds of um, uh, terms are used a lot. And so confidence messages are attempts to produce particular feelings and dispositions. And those include things like boldness, feeling bold, feeling pride, feeling joy, feeling self-love and much of the force of the confidence culture comes from its attempts to inculcate and shape our emotional lives through what Arlie Hochschild has dubbed feeling rules. So across all domains women are encouraged to be bold, to stand differently, to breathe differently, to move differently, to speak differently, to write emails differently. There's a special Google kind of a plugin if you wish that tells you when if you start your email but I just wanted to, or I'm so sorry to bother you, it deletes it, yeah? Um, to write emails differently, to stop apologizing, you know, just reading this list makes me tired <laughs> of how many practices and how many things women have to do, are demanded to do. And while we didn't investigate, and it's really interesting how, and would be really love to hear more from you about how women kind of perhaps internalize these messages and kind of relate to this, we use the concept of practice to really underscore the potential force of confidence culture in shaping not just how we think, not just how we feel and how we look, but crucially what we do and how we do and how we conduct ourselves. Well, and so the first one, um, you talked about the that the importance of confidence has been overinflated and used essentially as a tool of deflection away from systemic problems, which could not agree more. Um, but with that in mind, how can each of us at an individual level play a role in collectively working towards dismantling and altering some of these institutional problems that exist? Either one of you could take it. I think, first of all, by naming them and not by not by hiding behind a kind of assumed deficit in women mm -hmm. by actually talking about sexism, homophobia, racism, um, you know, structural injustices and um, putting it out there instead of assuming that the, the blame and the responsibility lies in women. Yeah, I think that's and at a broader level, then how can organizations also play a role? Because as you said, it's not about telling women, you know, you don't need to be confident per se, but it's more so that that is not the solve to the systemic problems that exist. Um, so what can organizations do as well to also play a role in dismantling some of these? Yeah, that's issues? a question also that we've heard a lot over the year when we've met lots of organization. And in the book, we end the book with suggesting to kind of shift from confidence culture to what we call climate of confidence. So, um, and for organizations, it's very much about nurturing and building an environment that would provide women and in fact, all employees with uh, a sense of first and foremost safety and, you know, well-being and the conditions to succeed. Um, and that goes, you know, that goes to the very perhaps boring, but still very important things that need to be spelled out, mm -hmm. um, like work hour cultures, you know, the toxic, the toxicity of nonstop and very demanding working hours. Um, that seem to have just kind of accelerated since the pandemic mm -hmm. um, and this kind of promise that somehow hybrid work will uh, make life um, easier and better for employees has actually flown in the face of many um, issues around caring and recognizing that, you know, employees have caring responsibilities, be it for the disabled, for elderly, for children. Mm -hmm. um, so this, to name only a few, but um, I, I think these would all for us very much come under the, the idea of a climate of confidence that is about the psychological, physical, you know, economic security, safety, and well-being of all employees. Mm -hmm. um, that is not about, and, and again, I think we, we don't want to say that none of these confidence trainings um, are helpful and perhaps 
you know, people, and we met individuals who said that was really helpful for me mm -hmm. at an individual level. So it's not about kind of, you know, getting rid of these, but we are alarmed and concerned that they have come to entirely substitute and obscure, you know, and also take resources from investing in thinking structurally mm -hmm. about a climate of confidence rather than individual confidence. I, I really like that, that kind of that reframe in terms mm. of looking at what's creating that ecosystem and that overall climate versus just placing the onus on individual women to, to create the change.